Hello, welcome to my video about evolution. This may be a little different from most discussions about evolution because I'm going to not talk about what evolution is, but about what it is not. And the reason for that is that whenever I discuss evolution with someone who says they're opposed to it, I find out that they don't actually know what evolution is. They often use arguments that are related to things that evolution has nothing to do with. So I think the first step to do when anyone is discussing evolution with someone else, especially someone who doesn't agree or accept evolution, is to clarify what evolution is not, and then perhaps a few words about what evolution actually is. So one of the first things to know is that evolution is not about one animal turning into another animal. In this case, a horse does not turn into an elephant. In fact, nowhere in any part of evolutionary theory is there any discussion of animals turning from one thing to another or giving birth to something other than what that animal actually is. For example, as we see here, Every animal gives birth to the same kind of animal or plant or whatever living thing we're talking about, including human beings. So geese only give birth to geese, zebras only give birth to zebras, bears only to bears, monkeys only to monkeys, and people only to human babies. In fact, this uh, idea that living creatures give birth to the same living creature and that goes all the way down to bacteria is not only clearly true but it's a critical aspect of understanding evolution evolution would not work if this were not true evolution says nothing about cosmology or the origin of the universe evolution is after all a biological theory and cannot be applied to whatever is not biological. And that, of course, includes the origin of the universe. The other very common misconception about evolution is that it includes understanding the origin of life or abiogenesis. That actually is not true. Even Darwin only briefly mentioned the origin of life in a speculative way. The theory of evolution is a biological theory but it does not include understanding the origin of life or any uh, principles or ideas about how the origin of life may have come about. This is a critically important point in arguments about evolution. There are some people who accept evolution quite readily, like myself, who have pr more problems with understanding how abiogenesis could have come about. One thing we know is that the theory of evolution really doesn't say much about how life evolved, which is outside the bounds of biological laws and principles. So what about technology? Is this evolution when we have, for example, in this case, telephones, starting with the old rotary dial, push button phones, and then uh, we have cordless telephones and eventually cell phones, and finally, uh, smartphones. What about that? Isn't that evolution? We see a lot of change. Well, it is change, and in some senses, evolution could be defined simply as change. But this is not a good analogy to biological evolution for many reasons, one of which is that technological items, such as telephones, cars, whatever, don't actually replicate themselves. They are made by an intelligent agent, us. And the mechanisms of natural selection seem to work, but they work in a very different way when we're talking about technology than when we're speaking of uh, biological evolution. In fact, this kind of evolution could be called cultural evolution, as all technological change, human technological change is. It's part of the fact that human beings undergo a type of evolution that is not related to genetics, but is called cultural evolution. And in fact, we see cultural evolution if we just look at the history of humanity. Uh, 
culture, human cultures, including technology, but also other things, have evolved, but not through biological evolution. So to go from hunter-gatherers to early farmers, all the way to the Industrial Revolution that we see here, all of that is a type of evolution, it's cultural evolution, but it's not part of the theory of biological evolution. Cultural evolution is a uniquely human construct. We don't see much cultural evolution outside of the human species, although it looks like there may be some small examples in other species. But humans, because of their brains, are able to develop a culture, and that culture can evolve. When we look at the origin of life, we have a cell that we call the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA. As you see here, we don't know what came before LUCA, but once that cell came into existence, we had evolution which gave rise to all of life and eventually to humans. The blue arrow, which indicates from the last universal common ancestor cell, the first cell that we think gave rise to all other life, that blue arrow really, we're pretty, we're pretty clear on how that works. There's a huge amount of scientific information to produce all the life that we see on Earth. However, I made the arrow from life to humans red because I don't think that all human characteristics are easily explained by evolution, or at least by uh, biological evolutionary theory. I think that there are some human characteristics that are difficult to explain on that basis. Things like creativity, love, many other uniquely human aspects that I consider come from the image of God. That's a religious view, but scientifically, I also still find it very difficult to explain the characteristics of human beings, which is so unique in, in the world of life. I find that was difficult to explain in terms of standard evolutionary theory related to genetic changes, followed by natural selection. Others disagree with me, and there are many theories proposed how certain kinds of evolution, of biological evolution, might explain all human characteristics, but I don't find them convincing. So to summarize, we can use evolutionary theory to examine how all life developed from the first, last universal common ancestor, from Luca, but we can't go back before that, and I think we have a hard time going forward to humans. Let's talk about Luca a little bit more. Luca was a very sophisticated cell. It had a membrane, DNA and RNA, metabolic enzymes, protein synthesis. It was able to make proteins. It was able to use ATP as the energy source. It had a very accurate reproduction system, and it had very complex and elaborate gene and enzymatic regulation. All of these features of LUCA still exist in all cells today, whether it's a, a bacterium, a simple plant, or us, or any other animal. And although life has gotten more complicated and more complex since LUCA, the origins of all of these systems and many others, uh, we don't know how they began because they have been with us as far back as we can go. This is why when people ask questions like, how did DNA come about? Uh, how is it that we have the very complex ATP production system or the very complex protein sy synthesis system? The answer is we just don't know. Evolution does not explain those systems. It's true because those systems were already present in the first cell that gave rise to all other life. So now that I've talked about what evolution is not, why don't we define what it actually is? And I'm not going to discuss a lot about what evolution is. I'm not going to cover fossils or the way genes change and pseudogenes and all the evidence for evolution. I'm simply going to state what the scientific definition is of biological evolution. And that is evolution is the change 
in allele frequencies in a population over time. That's the definition. Uh, if you don't know what alleles are, please take a look at my first uh, video on DNA and it's explained. Uh, and that will clear, clarify any questions you have there. So it's a change. It's a change in the frequency of different alleles in a population of organisms, different animal, a lot of animals, a lot of plants, and it occurs over time, sometimes considerable time. The change is driven by differences in fitness. And uh, the fitness is, of course, what is behind natural selection. Different alleles, and we call them P and Q, have different degrees of fitness. We look at the equation, W is fitness, and the different Ws stand for the fitness of different alleles and different genotypes. So the change in one allele, namely the allele frequency P, is equal to the formula that you see there. That is the scientific definition of evolution. Notice it says nothing about any animals changing it to anything else, nothing about the origin of life, nothing about cosmology or the beginning of the universe. It's a very straightforward and fairly clear definition of what evolution actually is. I do want to talk a little bit about how evolution works. And to do that, let's take a look at a population of animals. In this case, it's an animal that we call a liger. Now there are actual ligers which come from the breeding of lions and tigers, but I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about an imaginary animal that lived a long time ago before there were lions or tigers. And we call this animal, this liger, the common ancestor of both. Notice that the liger on the top, and of course I'm not including both the male and female, but Ligers give birth only to ligers, and that's true. As long as these animals, each one of these animals, can breed with other members of the same species, there will be no lot. There will be no evolutionary change in the sense of macroevolution. You'll never see this animal evolve into any other kind of animal. As I said earlier, this is a basic tenet of biology. Uh, it was recognized by the ancient writers of scripture who said that animals give birth only to their own kind. And that was a correct biological insight. And that is remains true today and it remains an important part of evolutionary theory. So then you could ask how is it that this animal, this liger, eventually gave rise to lions and tigers? because we're presuming for this example that that's what happened. And the answer is that what we can assume is that one population, some group of the ancestral animal, these ligers, crossed the mountain range, for example, or crossed a large desert or perhaps even a body of water and were not able to easily go back and forth. What that means is that the group of ligers on the left interbred with each other and the group of ligers on the right interbred with each other, but the two groups did not interbreed. Now both of these groups, as happens with all animals, over a long period of time started to evolve. They started to change in what's usually called microevolution. So on the left, that group of ligers lost the stripes and ended up with a different color of skin and hair. On the right, those ligers evolved differently. They lost other features. They kept the stripes, but they lost other fe features of the original population and they gained new ones. And this is just the normal process of microevolution over a long period of time. But what we see after a long period of time is that one species, the populations of one species, two separate populations, have given rise to two very different species. So a no lion ever turned into a tiger and no tiger ever turned into a lion. Both of them came from a common ancestor, which we call the ligers, 
and those common ancestors split into two populations that could not get back together, so they couldn't interbreed, and each population acted independently through a process of microevolution to give rise to a new species. There's no point at which one animal turned into another. This is a very gradual process. And all of those alleles that make specific characteristics evolved in a way over long periods of time to produce new characteristics and new kinds of animals. Now, this kind of evolution could also in a way be considered microevolution because after all, how different are lions and tigers? They can interbreed, it's been done. Uh, those offspring don't do well, but like many other closely related species, interbreeding is possible. Now, this version of evolution that I just showed you is not very different from the version of evolution that is promoted by young earth creation organizations such as Answer and Genesis. What you see here, if we look at, for example, let's look at that right tree, it's the main cat kind. What we see is a branching, pretty much the same way that I showed you with the ligers. Uh, and what they show is that one representative of the cat kind went on to the ark, but after the flood was over, that cat kind original ancestor, could be like the liger, began to branch out and produce all the kinds of cats that we see today. Lions, tigers, and of course they're also including house cats and leopards and all cheetahs and all kinds of cats. They call that all one of one of the cat, they're all part of the cat kind. Uh, we call that all part of the same family. We meaning people who hold to evolution. Uh, and of course, different species, different orders within the same family. So the standard view of evolution, the standard scientific view of evolution is not that different from the creationist view of how life diverged, except that uh, we think that the main cat kind, the one that's all the way down there on the right, and the same with the saber tooth on the left, that they also shared common ancestors, for example, with dogs and bears and other carnivores. And this goes all the way back in time. So the mechanism of evolution is not that different. There are some differences, but they're fairly small. What really is different is the amount of time that's involved. And of course, after the flood was a very short period of time to now, so the creationist version of evolution had to happen extremely quickly. So what I've said is that evolution is not a lot of things. And here I want to summarize. It's not antithetical to the New Testament. It's not anti-Christian. It's not refuted in the Bible. It's not really a salvation issue for Christians. And it is certainly not a scientific conspiracy. For all the people I've debated about evolution, none have told me that it was a salvation issue. Thank you for watching.